Gilligan started his chapter with an excerpt from Antonchikov's play entitled The Cherry Orchard, wherein Lupayan, who is a young merchant, convinces Madame Renevskaya to cut down the cherry orchard to save her estate, and he will buy it to replace it with summer cottages, wherein coming generations will see a new life. Lupayan is a self-made man who purchases an estate to end his family's awkward and unhappy life. To elaborate on his vision, he reveals the image of man that underlies and supports his activity and states, At times when I can't go to sleep, I think, Lord, thou givest us immense forests, unbounded fields, and the widest horizons, and living in the midst of them, we should indeed be giants. In which, Madame Renevskaya interrupts him by saying, You feel the need for giants. They are good only in fairy tales, anywhere else they only frighten us. This conveys that the concept of the human life cycle attempts to organize and understand the unfolding experiences and perceptions as well as the shifting desires and realities of everyday life. However, the nature of such concepts depends on the observer's perspective. Just like how Lupain and Madame Renevskaya have different opinions regarding the giant. Next, let us discuss observational bias. In the pursuit of social equality and justice, efforts are underway to end discrimination. But at the same time, in the social sciences, gender disparity is being rediscovered. This kind of discovery happens when ideas that were once thought to be scientifically objective and sexually neutral turn out to exhibit a persistent bias in both observation and evaluation. The belief that science is unbiased eventually loses its way to the realization that knowledge, categories, or products of human creation. Once we realize how accustomed we have grown to view the world through man's eyes, the obsession with the point of view that has shaped 20th century fiction and corresponding knowledge of the relativity of judgment also permeate our scientific understanding. Such a finding was made recently and is related to the apparently innocent classic by William Strunk and E.V. White, entitled The Elements of Style. Following a Supreme Court decision about sex discrimination, an English teacher noticed the fundamentals of the English language were being taught through examples that counterpose the birth of Napoleon, which is the writings of Coleridge, and phrases like, he was an interesting talker, a man who had traveled all over the world and lived in half a dozen countries, with, well, Susan, this is a fine mess you are in. Or less justically, he saw a woman, accompanied by two children, walking slowly down the road. Here, Gilligan points out that the teaching curriculum presents a gender bias towards males. These sentences used to teach grammar provide a good example of how teaching materials can be biased. Just like Strunk and White, psychological theorists have unintentionally succumbed to the same observational bias. By implicitly accepting the male way of life as the standard, they have attempted to shape women into objects of masculinity. And of course, it all stems back to the story of Adam and Eve that shows if you make a woman out of a man, you are bound to get into trouble. Just like in the Garden of Eden, the woman has always been the outlier in this life cycle. Gilligan stated that the tendency of developmental theorists to present a frighteningly masculine image to women may be traced back to Sigmund Freud's theory of psychosexual development on the experiences of the male infant that led to Oedipus complex. In the 1920s, Freud struggled to resolve the contradictions raised in his theory by the differences of female anatomy and different experiences of a young girl's early family relationships. Upon attempting to confirm women to his idea of a manly ideal and perceiving them as desiring what they had not had, he eventually recognized a developmental distinction in the resilience and strength of women's pre oedipal attachments to their mothers. He then considered that women's perceived developmental failure was caused by the disparity in women's development. Freud believed that women were naturally devoid of the drive for a definitive Oedipal resolution because he linked the development of the superego or conscience to anxiety related to castration. As a result, the superego of women, which is the heir apparent to the Oedipus complex, was never so inexorable, so impersonal, so independent of its emotional origins as we acquire it to be in men. Furthermore, according to this observation of difference, for women, the level of what is ethically normal is different from what it is in men. Freud then came to the conclusion that females show less sense of justice than men, that they are less ready to submit to the great exigencies of life, that they are more often influenced in their judgments by feelings of affection or hostility.
As a result, a theoretical problem must reframe as a developmental issue for women, with the issue in women's development being related to their experience in relationships. This led us to Nancy Chodorow's theory in 1974 that describes the differences between the sexes, not to physical characteristics but rather to the fact that women are generally responsible for taking care of young children. She explains how certain general and nearly universal differences that characterize masculine and feminine personalities and roles are passed down through generations. Basic sex differences recur in personality development because male and female children encounter and adapt differently to this early social environment. Because of this, feminine personality tends to define itself more in regard to the interaction with other individuals than masculinity in any particular community does. According to Gilligan's analysis, Chodorow bases her study mostly on the studies of Robert Stroller, which shows that gender identity, the constant foundation of personality development, is, for the most part, strongly and permanently formed for both sexes by the time a kid is 3 years old. Because females are often the primary caregivers for both sexes throughout the first three years of life, gender identity formation for boys and girls involves diverse interpersonal dynamics. The construction of female identity occurs within the framework of continuous relationships as mothers typically perceive their daughters as more similar to themselves. On the one hand, girls also see themselves as similar to their mothers when they identify as female, thus combining the process of identity development with the attachment experience. On the other hand, mothers view their sons as the opposite of what it is to be a man, and boys, in their attempt to define what it means to be a man, distance themselves from their mothers, reducing their capacity for basic affection and empathy. Therefore, male growth involves a more defensive firming of experience ego boundaries and a more forceful individuation. Issues of sexuality and distinction have become entwined for boys. As Chodoro is against the masculinity bias of psychoanalytic theory, she argues that gender disparities in early individuation and relationship experiences do not imply that women are more prone to psychosis or have weaker ego boundaries than men. Rather, it means that unlike boys, girls come out of this space when a foundation for empathy established in their core identity. Thus, Chodoro offers a direct and positive account of her own understanding of female psychology in place of Freud's negative and derivative one, as girls gain a stronger foundation for perceiving and experiencing another person's needs and feelings as their own. Moreover, females do not identify themselves as much as boys do in terms of rejecting pre oedipal relational forms. As a result, regressing to these modes usually doesn't feel like such a basic threat to their ego. And because they are raised by a person of the same gender from a very young age, girls begin to perceive themselves as less distinct from boys, as more integrated and connected to the outside world, and as having a different perspective on their inner world. Therefore, relationships, specifically issues of dependency, are experienced differently by men and women. Separation from the mother is necessary for the development of masculinity, hence, for boys and men, individuation and separation are closely linked to gender identity. For girls and women, however, issues of femininity or feminine identity do not depend on individuation or the achievement of separation from the mother. Intimacy threatens the identity of a male, but separation threatens the identity of a female because masculinity is characterized by separation and femininity by attachment. Men, therefore, often struggle with partnerships while women typically struggle with individuation. The developmental liability associated with women's quality of embeddedness in social interaction and personal relationships, as contrasted with men's lives, becomes more than just a descriptive difference when the psychological literature identifies childhood and adolescence developmental milestones as indicators of growing levels of separation. The inability of women to separate subsequently equates to a failure to grow. The studies on children's game throughout the middle childhood years reveal the sex variations and personality formation that Chodorow discusses in the early childhood years. So now, let us move on to the developmental theories of psychology during middle childhood. Jean Piaget in 1932 and George Herbert Mead in 1934 saw children's game as the social development laboratory of the school years. Through playing games, Kids can learn to step into the shoes of others and understand themselves from their perspective. 
They can also develop an appreciation for rules and understand how they may be created and altered. Similarly, Janet Lever in 1976 set out to see whether there were sex differences in the games that kids play because she believed that play was a major socialization activity throughout the elementary school years and that the peer group acted as the agent of socialization. Lever observed the organization and structure of the recreational activities of 181 white middle-class students in the 5th grade, ages 10 to 11. She kept diaries detailing the children's stories of their after-school activities in addition to observing them play at recess and physical education class. Lever summarizes the gender disparities found in the study as follows. Males play outside more frequently than girls do. Boys play in large, age-diverse groups more frequently than girls do. Boys also play competitive games more frequently and for longer periods of time than girls games. In several respects, the most intriguing discovery is the last one because boys games seem to go on longer than girls, not only because they require a higher skill level and therefore less likely to get boring, but also because boys were better at resolving conflicts that arose during a game. Throughout the study, boys were observed arguing frequently but no games was ever stopped for longer than 7 minutes and in the most heated arguments, the conclusion was always to repeat the play, usually followed by a chorus of cheaters' proof. In fact, the boys appeared to derive similar enjoyment from the legal debates as they did from the game itself, and even participants who were marginal in terms of height or talent took part in these frequent arguments. On the contrary, the game would usually finish when argument broke out among the girls. Thus, Lever expands upon and supports Piaget's findings from his study of the game's rules, that boys grow progressively more fascinated throughout childhood with the legal development of rules and the creation of fair procedures for resolving disputes, a fascination that he notes does not extend to girls. According to Piaget, girls view rules more pragmatically, viewing them as beneficial as long as they advance the game. When it comes to rules and regulations, girls are more understanding, more willing to make exception for men, and more open to accepting new ideas. Because of this, Piaget believes that the legal sense, which is crucial to moral development, is significantly less developed in young girls than in boys. Lever's study is likewise tainted by the bias that causes Piaget to compare the development of males and children. Her analysis of the data is shaped by the assumption the, the male model is superior since it more closely satisfies the needs of contemporary corporate success. In contrast, the sensitivity and empathy that girls learn from playing are not useful in the market and may even hinder a successful career. Lever suggests that a girl will have to play like a male if she wants to avoid being dependent on men in adulthood due to the realities of life. In response to Piaget's claim, the children acquire the respect for rules required for moral development through rule-bound games, Lawrence Kohlberg in 1969 adds that role-taking opportunities that come up during dispute resolution are the most effective way for children to absorb these lessons. Hence, the moral lessons inherent in girls' play appear to be fewer than in boys. According to Lever's conclusion, boys acquire the independence and organizing abilities needed to plan the activities of big, diverse group of people from the games they play. In contrast, girls' play usually occurs in private settings and in smaller, more personal groups, most frequently with their best friends. In mid's terms, it's less about the obstruction of human interactions and more about adopting the role of the generalized other. However, it encourages the growth of the sensitivity and empathy required to adopt the role of the particular other and moves more toward understanding the other as distinct from the self. Lever's observations of sex differences in middle childhood play activities thus add to the sex disparities in early childhood personality formation that Chodoro deduces from her examination of the mother-child interaction. Taking all the accounts together implies that girls and boys have distinct social experiences and interpersonal orientations when they approach puberty. However, female development has been seen to be the most divergent and consequently the most difficult at this period because adolescence is thought to be a critical time for separation or at the period of the second individuation process. And so, we now move on the adolescent stage, which is puberty.
According to Freud, this new wave of repression in girls is indicative of a significant increase in the arousal of boys and is essential for the development of the girl's masculine sexuality as a young girl into her uniquely feminine sexuality as an adult. According to Freud, this change resulted from the girl realizing and accepting the fact of her castration. Freud explains that puberty to a girl brings a new awareness of the wound to her narcissism and leads her to develop a sense of inferiority. According to Eric Erikson's elaboration of Freud's psychoanalytic theory, adolescence is when development depends on identity. Therefore, the girl either comes at this point psychologically vulnerable or with a different agenda. So now, let us talk about Eric Erikson's theory of psychosocial development. His theory clearly illustrates female adolescence dilemma for human development theorists. Adolescence is the fifth out of eight stages of Erikson's theory of psychosocial development in 1950. The goal at this stage is to develop a cohesive sense of self, confirm an identity that can withstand the irregularities of puberty, and enable the adult ability to love and work. Erikson's explanation of the crisis that defined the four stages before adolescence identity crisis outlines the necessary conditions for successfully resolving the problem. The task then clearly becomes one of individuation, even though the initial crisis in the infancy of trust versus mistrust anchors development in the experience of a relationship. The focal point of Erikson's second stage is the crisis of autonomy versus shame and doubt, which signifies the walking child's developing feeling of separateness and agency. From then on, growth continues through the initiative versus guilt crisis, the successful resolution of which signifies an additional step toward autonomy. Children then realize that to compete with their parents, they must first join them and learn from what they do so well after the inevitable disappointment of the magical wishes of the Oedipal stage. Thus, the middle childhood years are characterized by a dilemma of industry versus inferiority wherein a child's ability to demonstrate competence becomes crucial to developing their self-esteem. This is the moment when kids want to understand and become proficient with the technology of their culture so they may identify as grown-ups and be acknowledged by others. Next comes the adolescent stage, marking the celebration of the independent, proactive, and hardworking self through developing an identity based on a philosophy that can validate and sustain adult commitments. However, to whom does Erikson is referring to? He actually refers only to the male child. Erikson, in 1968, notes that the sequence of his psychosocial development stages is slightly different for the female. As the female gets ready to attract the man whose name she will be recognized by, whose position she will be identified by, the one who would fill the inner space and save her from loneliness and emptiness, she suspends her identity. While for men, in the ideal cycle of human separation and attachment, identification comes first before intimacy, and generativity. However, these roles appear to be combined for women. Identity and intimacy go hand in hand as the woman learns to know herself through her relationships with other people. Erikson noted that there are distinctions between the sexes, but his life cycle diagram does not change. Intimacy comes after identification since a man's experience shapes his understanding of the life cycle. However, there is minimal preparation for the intimacy of the first adult stage in this male life cycle. Erikson's concept of intimacy and generativity and Freud's concept of genitality both imply a mutuality that is only suggested in the early stages of trust versus mistrust. The rest is separateness which makes relationships seem like developmental barriers, as frequently when evaluating women. As a result, development itself becomes associated with separation. It is scarcely new for Erikson to characterize feminine identity as emerging from an intimate interaction with another individual and masculine identity as being shaped in reference to the outside world. A similar portrayal can be found in the fairy tales described by Bruno Bettelheim. A classic example of the dynamics of male adolescence is the confrontation between the father and the son in the three languages. Here, the son makes a successful comeback from his teenage conflict with his father a giant of the life cycle conception because of the other knowledge he gains benefit from him just as well. On the contrary, a quite different scenario illustrates the dynamics of female adolescence. 
the fairy tale Snow White and Sleeping Beauty, the adolescent heroines wake up not to conquer the world, but to marry their prince. They both define their identity inwardly and interpersonally. Thus, Bettelheim and Erikson state that for women, intimacy and identity are closely linked. And for sex differences, Bettelheim used the fantasy of the woman warrior in the autobiographical novel of Maxine Hong Kingston that repeatedly indicates that active adventure is a male activity and that if a woman wants to go on such activities, she should at least dress like a man. Now let us proceed to the next part of our discussion, primarily on sex roles by David McClellan. Psychologists have observed sex disparities in their research. Since they began conducting empirical research, which lends credence to David McClellan's conclusion that sex role is one of the most significant factors of human behavior. However, psychologists have tended to view male behavior as the norm and female behavior as some sort of deviation from it because it is difficult to say different without also saying better or worse because there is a tendency to construct a single scale of measurement and because that scale has typically been derived from and standardized on the basis of men's interpretations of research data drawn predominantly or exclusively from studies of men. Thus, it has typically been assumed that there is problem with women when they do not meet psychological expectations. Next is about competitive achievement by Martina Horner. Martina Horner discovered that women's anxiousness over achieving competitively was a problem. Evidence of sex differences seemed to confuse and complicate data analysis and hindered research on human motivation. Using the thematic a perception test, TAT, from the beginning, an ambiguous view is presented from interpretation in the TAT such as an image about which a story needs to be written or a section of a story that needs to be finished. Psychologists believe that because these stories exhibit projective imagination, they can provide insights in how individuals understand their experiences, implicitly how they can make sense of their lives. It was evident before Horner's research that women perceive competitive accomplishment scenarios differently than men did, either because of how they perceive them or because of the distinct reactions they elicited in them. Based on his study of men, McClellan separated the idea of accomplishment motivation into what seemed to be its two logical components, a desire to approach success, hope success, a motive to avoid failure, fear of failure. A third category Horner discovered from her research on men was the unlikely motivation to avoid success, fear success. Women seem to struggle with competitive achievement, which seems to stem from perceived conflict between femininity and success. This dilemma is often experienced by young girls and women trying to reconcile their early childhood identification and women aspiration with the more masculine skills they have learned at school. According to Horner's analysis of women's conditions of story in which Anne finds herself at the top of her medical school class after her first term finals and her observation of women's performance in competitive achievement situations, young women become anxious and their positive achievement strivings are thwarted when success is likely or possible and threatened by the negative consequences they expect to follow success. She comes to the conclusion that the reason most women experience this fear is because they anticipate unfavorable outcomes from competitive and achievement activities, particularly when they are up against men. The repercussions include the possibility of social rejection and losing their femininity. However, such disputes concerning achievement could be seen differently. According to Giorgio Sassen, the women's conflicts could instead point to heightened awareness of the other side of competitive success or the significant emotional cost associated with success attained through competition. This understanding, through confused, suggests an underlying sense that something is wrong in the state where success is defined as outperforming everyone else in terms of grades. As Sassen notes, Horner discovered that women only experience success anxiety in situations where performance was directly competitive. That is when one person's success came at the expense of another's failure. Erickson uses George Bernard Shaw's life as an example in his explanation of the identity crisis to highlight how young people feel that their success in a field they cannot fully support has prematurely appropriated them. Looking back on his life at 70, Shaw explained that his crisis at 20 was not due to lack of success or recognition but rather to too much of both. Erickson interprets Shaw's refusal as indicating the remarkable aspects of exceptional personality emerging rather than a sign of neurotic worry related to rivalry and performance. Based on these arguments, we might start to wonder why males are so willing to embrace and celebrate a very limited definition of success rather than why women argue about competitive achievement. We can begin to understand why the fear of success tends to vanish in Horner's tale of competitive success when Anne becomes John and the story is completed by men. This is because, as Fia J noted and Lever confirmed, 
boys in their games are more concerned with news while girls are more concerned with relationship. Often at the expense of the game itself, we can also understand this by considering Shalorov's conclusion that men's social orientation is positional while women is personal. Now, let us proceed with Virginia Woolf's take on this issue. Well, according to her, it is obvious that women's value frequently vary from those established by the other sex. However, she continues that masculinity is what really prevails. Consequently, women begin to doubt the validity of their emotions and modify their assessments to consider the opinions of others. Self-doubt and qualification are common manifestations of the challenges that women face in finding or speaking publicly in their own voices. Other signs include indications of a divided judgment or public and private assessment that are fundamentally at odds. However, Wolf believes that women's strength lies in the deference and confusion that she criticizes in them. Women's deference stems from the depth of their moral concern and social subordination. Women are more likely to listen to voices other than their own and consider different points of view when making decisions because of their sensitivity to others' needs and sense of responsibility for providing care. It is therefore impossible to separate women's moral strength, which is an overwhelming concern for relationships and responsibilities, from their moral weaknesses, which appears to be dispersion and confusion of judgment. It's possible that the unwillingness to pass judgment is a sign of the empathy and care that permeate women's development psychology and are accountable for things that are typically viewed as problematic. As a result, women do not only define themselves in the context of human relationships but also judge themselves in terms of their ability to care. Women's place in man's life cycle has been that of nurturer, caretaker, and helpmate, and the weaver of those networks of relationships on which she, in turn, relies. However, although women have taken care of men in this way, men have the tendency to do either assume or devalue this care in their economic arrangements and theories of psychological development when individuation and individual success became the primary focus in adulthood, and when maturity is associated with personal autonomy. Women's concern for relationships is perceived as a weakness rather than a human strength. According to the studies of Broverman Bogel, Broverman Claxon, and Rosenkrantz in 1972, there is no better place to see the differences between womanhood and adulthood than in the sex role stereotype. Their study consistently showed that the traits associated with masculinity are autonomous thought and rational decision-making and responsible action are those that are viewed as necessary for adulthood and are viewed negatively as feminine characteristics. The stereotypes imply a speaking of love and labor, elevating instrumental skills to the dominant of men, relegating expressive capacities to women. From an alternative viewpoint, however, these stereotypes reveal a balanced understanding of adulthood that values the individual over social connections and leans more toward an independent career than a mutual support of love and care. Women have always understood the value of closeness, relationship, and caregiving, a realization that men in their middle years are now beginning to appreciate. However, psychologists have neglected to explain the development of this knowledge because it has been assumed that women's knowledge is intuitive or instinctive. According to Gilligan's research, a crucial line for psychological development in both sexes' life is marked by women's moral development, which is centered on the elaboration of that knowledge. In the literature of human development, moral development not only offers the concluding example of recurring pattern in the observation and evaluation of sex differences, but it also explains in more detail why women's development has been so long hidden and veiled in mystery. Freud's critic of women's sense of justice, which he saw as compromised by the rejection of blind impartiality, was reiterated not only on the studies of Piaget, but also in Colbert's. Thus, let us now talk about the six stages of moral development of Lawrence Colbert. So while girls are treated as afterthought and a curiosity in Piaget's account of moral judgment of the child, they receive four brief entries in an index that excludes boys entirely because the child is presumed to be male. Females are simply non-existent in the research that Colbert uses to support his theory. The six stages that Colbert describes as development of moral judgment from childhood to adulthood were empirically developed from a study of 84 boys which Colbert has followed for more than 20 years. Despite Colbert's assertion that his stage sequence is universal, the groups that were left out of his initial sample seldom advised to his latter stage. According to Colbert's scale, women appear disproportionately among those lacking moral development. Their assessment seemed best to represent the third stage of his six-stage model. In this stage, goodness is associated with serving and appeasing others, and morality is understood in terms of interpersonal relationships. According to Colbert and Kramer, 
this idea of goodness is appropriate for mature women's life as long as those lives are spent at home. According to Colbert and Kramer, women won't be able to see the shortcomings of this moral viewpoint until they join the traditional male domain. After that, they won't be able to advance toward higher stages such as stage 4 where relationships are subject to rules and stages 5 and 6 where rules are subordinated to universal principles of justice. However, this creates a paradox because the very qualities that have historically been used to define the goodness of women, which is their concern for and sensitivity to the needs of others, also characterize them as lacking in moral development. According to this theory of moral development, men's lives are studied to determine what constitutes maturity and this highlights the significance of individuation in men's development. In contrast to Piaget's argument, wherein Piaget argues that conception of development hangs from its vertex of maturity, the point toward which progress is traced, challenging the widespread belief that a developmental theory is built like a pyramid from its base in infancy. As a result, modifying the definition of maturity modifies the understanding of development and the inure account and changes how the highest stage is described. A moral conception that differs from that of Freud, Piaget, and Colbert starts to take shape when one starts with the study of women and draws developmental construct from their lives. This leads to a different explanation of development. According to this view, a moral dilemma is caused by competing obligations rather than conflicting rights. It can only be resolved by adopting contextual narrative as opposed to the formal, abstract way of thinking, like the idea of fairness in morality links moral development to the knowledge of rights and regulations. This concept of morality as their activities revolves around moral development, around the comprehension of relationships and responsibility. One possible explanation for women's failure to grow within the confines of the system is what they construct moral dilemmas differently than men do. Colburn states that the highest levels of moral development result from a thoughtful grasp of human rights and he views all conceptions of responsibility as a proof of conventional moral understanding. Two answers to interview questions about the nature of morality demonstrate how morality of rights differs from the morality of responsibility in that it emphasizes separation rather than connection and views the individual rather than the relationship as primary. The first is provided by a 25-year-old man who participated in Colbert's study with the question, what does the world morality mean to you? He answered the question is unknown to anybody on the planet. It is, in his opinion, acknowledging one's own and other people's right, not stepping upon those liberties. Treat them fairly just as we would like to be treated. He believes the main goal is to protect people's basic right to exist. That, in his opinion, is the most crucial. Second, the freedom of individual to pursue his goal without infringing upon the rights of others. And how have your views on morality changed since last interview? He then said that he believes his awareness of a person's right has increased. He used to approach it solely from his perspective only, but now he believes that he is now more conscious of each person's rights. According to Kohlberg, this man's response represents the principal understanding of human rights that characterizes his fifth and sixth stages. In response, Kohlberg's remarks moving to a viewpoint distinct from his societies, he associates morality with justice, fairness, rights, the golden rule, with acknowledging other people's rights as they are defined inherently or naturally. The formula defining rights before social legislation is the human being's right to do as he pleases without interfering with the rights of others. The second respondent who participated in the rights and responsibilities study was a 25-year-old third-year law student. Her first question was, is there really some correct solution to moral problems or is everybody's opinion equally right? She answered, saying she doesn't believe that all points of view are equally valid. She believes that there could be equally valid in opinions in some circumstances and one could ethically choose to follow one of several options. However, there are other circumstances where she believes that there are right and wrong answers. These situations stem from the fact that everyone on this planet needs to coexist in order to survive. We must rely on another one. Ideally, this is not just a physical need but also a need of self-fulfillment. One's life is enhanced by working with others and trying to live harmoniously with all others. To that end, there are things that are wrong and right. Things that move toward that end and things that move away from it. In this way, it is possible to make decisions in some situation between various actions that clearly advance or impede that goal. Followed by a question, is there a time in the past when you would have thought about these things differently? And answer that yes. When she was still in high school, she believed that there was a period in her life when she believed that morality was very subjective and that neither or nor anyone could make moral decisions because we all had our own conscience. Following a period of introspection and doubt, this response also reflects a personal reconstruction of morality. 
However, the reconstruction of moral understanding is predicated on the what she described as an intense sense of global responsibility rather than the importance and universality of individual rights. The moral dilemma in this construction is not how to exercise one's right without infringing on the rights of others, but rather how to live a moral life that involves obligations to oneself, family, and society at large. Limiting responsibilities without sacrificing moral concern then becomes the issue. Thus, this woman worries about the possibility of omission that is not helping others when you could help him or them, while Colbert's subject worries about people interfering with each other's rights. The problem this woman presents is solved by Jane Lewinger, fifth autonomous stage of ego development, which defines autonomy as regulating an excessive sense of responsibility by acknowledging that the other people are responsible for their own fate in a relationship. In a Lovinger's account, the autonomous stage observes that the abandonment of moral dichotomies and their substitution with an appreciation for the complexity and multifaceted nature of real people and real situation. In Goldberg's principal level, stages 5 and 6, the right's conception of morality aims to resolve moral dilemmas in a way that is objectively fair or just and that all rational people could agree upon. In contrast, the responsibility conception describes the conflicts that persist and the limitations of any specific resolution. Hence, it is evident why a morality based on rights and non-interference could seem unsettling to women due to its ability to rationalize apathy and neglect. Simultaneously, it becomes evident why a morality of responsibility with its existence and contextual relativism appears uncertain and unclear to men. The pattern found in the description of the developmental differences between the sexes is thus explained by women's moral judgments, but they also offer a different definition of maturity that can be used to evaluate these differences and determine their implications. Women's psychology has always been characterized as unique because of their stronger emphasis on relationships and interdependence, which suggests a more contextual mood of judgment and a distinct moral understanding. Women bring a different perspective to the life cycle and prioritize different aspects of the human experience because of the disparities in their conceptions of morality and self. And finally, moving on to the last part of the discussion is about the myth of Demeter and Persephone. McClellan uses the myth of Demeter and Persephone as an example of how women should view power. This myth was linked for more than 2,000 years to the Eleusinian mystery, which were celebrated in classical Greece. The story of Persephone, as it is told in the Honor Kim to Demeter, demonstrates the virtues of resource accumulation, living, and the interdependence that McLuhan discovered to the characteristics of the mature feminine style in his research on power motivation. Even though it is popular, according to McLuhan, to conclude that no one knows what happens in the mystery, it is known that there were likely the most significant religious ceremonies, at least according to the historical accounts that were planned by and for women particularly in the beginning before men started to dominate them through the cult of Dionysus, McClellan views the myth as a unique way to present feminine psychology. Moreover, it is the epitome of life cycle tale. It acknowledges the ongoing significance of attachment in the human life cycle, which helps to explain the enigmatic mystery of women's development. The role of the woman in the life cycle of men is to safeguard this recognition, and the litany of development celebrates individuation, autonomy, separation, and natural rights. The myth of Persephone directly addresses the distortion in this perspective by serving as a reminder that narcissism is fatal, that the Earth's fertility is inexplicably linked to the continuation of mother-daughter relationships, that the life cycle itself results from a cyclical exchange between the worlds of men and women. Life cycle theories, theories will only become more successful when they divide their focus and start living with women as they have with men. Only then will their vision encompass the experiences of both sexes. That is all for our presentation. Thank you for listening.